second lecture by Jesse Keller. Great. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to continue our discussion of QCD and collider physics. And uh, in this lecture, I want to start bringing ourselves from Feynman diagrams to cross-sections of interest. Um, and I'm not going to talk that much about how one actually goes about computing Feynman diagrams. So that's uh, in this master formula here is, and of course, this amplitude squared. Um, but what I really want to emphasize uh, in this lecture is how, if someone were to give you this object, how one goes about converting that into, uh, into a cross-section and some of the conceptual challenges uh, that appear when trying to make that translation. So last time I introduced the master formula for collider physics. And again, everything that we're going to do for the remainder of these lectures in some ways traces back to this. For the scattering of beams A and B to make some number of final states, that we have an overall geometric factor. We have to sum over all possible numbers of final states and integrate over Lorentz invariant phase space times the amplitude. And then crucially, we have to choose what observable uh, we want to measure. And there's a couple things that I want to make sure that you remember from last time. Um, that these uh, 1 to, to n, uh, that these are supposed to be uh, collider stable, or at least quasi-stable uh, particles. And so strictly speaking, we are allowed to have particles like protons, electrons, photons, muons, k-longs, pi plus minus, k plus minus, so on. These can appear as the objects of 1 through n. Um, but again, kind of strictly speaking, we're not really supposed to think about pi naught separately. We're supposed to treat uh, the final states as being the photons. Of course, in reality, uh, we know that this is a, a sufficiently long-lived particle that we don't need to worry about kind of various interference effects. We can think about producing a pi naught, and then that pi naught decays to gamma gamma. So we can do calculations involving pi naught and then subsequently do that decay. But again, strictly speaking, at long times, what you see are photons. You don't see that pi naught directly. Um, and certainly, uh, what you don't see is you don't directly see uh, standard model states. So we don't see the quarks of the standard model. We don't see the heavy resonances. Strictly speaking, don't, those don't appear in this master formula. And so anytime someone tells you about, hey, I want to talk about a top quark cross-section, so something like PP to TT bar, you can ask, what do they mean by that? Because again, strictly speaking, in this master formula, tops are not states that I can see at late times. Uh, so what do I really mean uh, with this? And somehow we're going to have to massage this master formula in order to make sense of that process. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is I want to emphasize that you really do have to choose what you're measuring. Um, and I'll just give you an example of that in, in just a moment. Um, even if you want to do something like the total cross-section, you have to decide how do you want to treat the case of glancing blows where the protons just right by each other. Does that contribute to the total cross-section? Does elastic scattering count in your, uh, in your PP total cross-section or not? So you have to make a decision. Um, and those decisions are kind of inevitable. Um, and then another thing uh, just to... To, to emphasize is that you have to make sure that you do the complete sum uh, and integral over, over the phase space. You really have to con cons uh, consider all possible configurations. Um, and something that will come up later, which is a confusion, um, is that uh, when we talk about doing higher order perturbative calculations where we have real emission diagrams and virtual diagrams, um, if we don't include these higher multiplicities, we can just get the wrong answer for processes. And in particular, if you don't include those higher multiplicities, there's a sense in which your cross-sections will end up uh, becoming zero, because uh, there's always a probability of having tiny little uh, photon emissions. Um, and if you don't include all possible little photon emissions, uh, then you're not going to get uh, the right uh, answer for what you actually physically measure. Um, so here I'm talking about cross-sections, and I'll be doing things in the context of the standard model. Um, but you might want to you know, think about, you know, what about beyond the standard model physics? I mean, a lot of us in this room care about knowing what dynamics might lie beyond the standard model. And what does that look like um, in this language? And at some very basic level, searching for physics beyond the standard model is just the same as measuring a cross-section and comparing it to what the standard model predicts. So basically, you measure a cross-section for some process for some observable, versus the cross-section for that observable as predicted in the stand standard model. And a mismatch is what we would call physics beyond the standard model. 
So even when you're doing a search at some level, you really need to think about uh, the observables that you're trying to measure. So for example, you know, if I'm trying to look for supersymmetry, um, and I want to search for supersymmetry in a final state that involves jets, let's say some leptons, some uh, missing momentum. Um, what am I really doing? I'm, I'm measuring the cross-section for this particular final state with particular choices of kinematics. Um, so just as, a, as an example diagram, we can imagine plucking up quarks out of the proton, slamming them together. Maybe there's some T-channel gluino exchange, which converts these up quarks into up squarks. Um, we don't see these states in the final state. They're not in that, in that one to end, so I have to consider the decays of those states. So let's say one of these goes to, um, to chargino and uh, a down quark. This chargino, uh, let's say, goes to a, a neutralino um, and a W boson. That W boson decays uh, to uh, a positron and a neutrino. Let's say on this side, I go to an, an up quark and, uh, and a neutralino. Uh, the details of this don't matter at all for this discussion. Um, but the states here, you know, we can ask which one of these actually would appear in that master formula. Positrons I can see directly, so I can put some threshold cut. Say I want to look for a positron above a given energy threshold. Uh, neutrinos and uh, neutralinos, if these neutralinos are, are exactly stable, for example, as dark matter candidates, they would appear as missing momentum. As we'll explain next lecture, if I make uh, quarks, these will eventually form into jets. And so intuitively, it seems like I'm what I'm trying to measure is I'm trying to measure the cross-section for two jets plus a single positron plus missing momentum. And you can ask, you know, what is that rate? Well, that rate depends very sensitively on what you mean by this definition of what a jet is. Um, and it depends on, for example, the energy thresholds that you put in this jet, the algorithm that you use to define that jet. Um, and it depends on more subtle issues uh, that we'll get into uh, next time, uh, because this process has, along with the initial state radiation, where I can have, let's say, gluons emitted from the initial state. Does that count as a jet or not? Um, we have final state radiation, where gluons can be emitted from colored particles. Is that final state radiation does it count as part of the jet, or does it count as the production of a separate jet? Um, there's uh, non-perturbative effects, like underlying events uh, coming from the beam remnants. How does that affect the definition of what we're doing? Um, and then there's the issue that I mentioned before, where when you're doing collisions at the LHC, you don't just get two, or, uh, two protons colliding, not just one proton-proton collision, but 50, roughly, at the same time. Um, how do you deal with that in terms of the definition of what you're, what you're trying to do? Um, so that's a complication that we have to deal with. We have to, to say, what are we measuring? And then we have to consider, for that definition of a measurement, how does that play with the standard model prediction for that measurement? Um, so can you tell the difference? Can you tell the difference of this supersymmetric process versus a standard model process uh, uh, that um, might give rise to the same final state? So for example, if I slam together protons, and they make Z bosons and W bosons plus some number of jets, so this is some electroweak plus QCD process, where this Z boson, let's say, goes to neutrinos, this W goes to a positron and a neutrino, these neutrinos will contribute to a missing momentum signature. This positron we already talked about, we have these jets. How can I tell the difference between these? And then you also have to account for experimental effects, where I could have protons making a top quark and an anti-top. That top will go to a B and a W. That W will go to um, a positron and a neutrino. Let's say this one goes in an all-hadronic final state to an anti-B, a W that goes to two jets. Again, I have missing momentum from the neutrino. I have my positron. And now I have some number of jets. And you'd say, oh, this is different than this process over here, because these jets are B-jets. And as I mentioned a little bit last time, you can use displaced vertex signatures to tell the difference between those and ordinary jets. Ah, but what's the efficiency for that? And maybe your experiment doesn't perfectly separate those different jet types. And so a measurements unavoidably, these cross-sections uh, unavoidably, mix together different processes to some degree. 
And one of the goals in collider physics is to come up with clever observables that can distinguish this type of process from these processes, keeping in mind that at, at the end of the day, we do have to define things in terms of measurements. And there's also a limit to how much you can do separation of processes if there is, for example, interference between standard model and, uh, and beyond the standard model uh, processes. So this is the challenge that we're confronting uh, when we're doing collider physics. So this looks like a daunting problem. Um, and especially here, if I'm telling you that I have to do all my analyses in terms of those, uh, those collider stable particles, how am I ever going to make a prediction? And there's like hundreds to thousands of particles produced in each LHC collision. How is it at all possible <laughs> to, make, to make sense of this? And luckily, and that's going to be the theme of these lectures, luckily there's a simplification if you choose the appropriate measurement. If you measure things in the appropriate way, in particular if you measure things sufficiently inclusively, then we can replace some of these complications um, with much simpler processes to compute. So in particular, um, just leaving this on the board, uh, if you choose your uh, observable, actually let me just erase it. Um, if you choose your, your observable uh, cleverly enough, then you can make the following replacement. So for for sufficiently inclusive observables. You can do the following. You can say, OK, the real process that I'm supposed to calculate is proton, proton. Those are my A and B beams going to one of these hadron final states, hadron 1, hadron 2, hadron two um, up to hadron n. And I'm supposed to be making an observable measurement on this hadronic final state. But if your observable is sufficiently inclusive, you can make a replacement. Instead of looking at these par protons, you can look at partons, quarks and gluons inside the proton, parton A, parton B, going to parton 1 plus parton 2 plus parton M possibly with a change in what you mean by your measurement. You can make that replacement, and if you're lucky, uh, you can make this replacement where the number of partons that you have to consider can be much smaller than the number of hadrons you have in the final state. So we'll be able to get good approximations to cross-sections. Even though, in principle, we're talking about cross-sections involving hundreds, thousands of particles, we'll be able to do it with a small number of partons if I choose my observables in the appropriate way. Now, this replacement is not automatic at all. Uh, in fact, the proof that you can do that replacement uh, only uh, exists for a small subset of cases. Um, and some of what I'm telling you is only conjectural uh, that it actually works. But it's crucial for making predictions at the LHC, which is why I'm keeping emphasizing it. And what you measure matters uh, uh, if you want to have theoretical control, for example, by converting from this line uh, to, to this line. Um, and more formally, uh, what we have uh, is uh, factorization. And what factorization tells you, in special cases, when you've chosen the appropriate observables, it says that in the master formula, where we had our amplitude squared and our observable, that we can basically break this up into pieces. And instead of thinking about this whole complicated process of creating you know, hadrons, uh, we can think about subprocesses. So I'll just put these in quotes for subprocess A, subprocess B, subprocess C, and so on. Um, and again, this modified observable plus small controlled corrections. And again, the, 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 um, the proof 
that this is possible depends on the thing that you're measuring. But if you choose sufficiently inclusive things, you can break up this complicated amplitude into smaller sub-amplitudes, or kind of semi-classical probabilities, again, perhaps with a modified measurement, plus corrections that you hope are suppressed by, uh, let's say, suppressed by uh, the confinement scale over some uh, uh, hard scattering scale to some power, such that you can claim that at high enough energies, this is, this is controlled. And I want to try to give you some examples of formulas like this so you get a sense of it. I'm not going to try to prove it, um, but I want to give you at least some sense in these lectures uh, of a case where we know that things like this happen. And again, this is the key for making, making predictions at the LHC. So let me pause for a moment and see if there's any questions before in this lecture I give you two examples of factorization. Yeah? Yeah. To make our calculational problem simpler. Yeah. Uh, in, well, good. So, so. Uh, so, if you ask sufficiently inclusive questions, then the mapping between this is irrelevant. Okay, so when you ask sufficiently inclusive questions, you're basically being agnostic to this mapping from one to the other. And you're saying, I'm making a measurement, I'm making a cross-section measurement, up to corrections, I'm going to just do the calculation for that cross-section, and I'm not going to try to do the more detailed interpretation of really trying to ask questions about which hadrons came from which parton. That's a very challenging thing to answer, and in fact, it's just ambiguous. But when you do sufficiently inclusive measurements, you end up losing information, but you end up gaining predictive power. And that's the, and that's the, that's the goal, and that's the trade-off. So we will not ask the question, did this particular pion come from this particular quark? That's not what we're going to ask. We're going to ask, given the overall distribution of hadrons that I see, can I mimic the overall distribution of hadrons by some uh, calculation that I can do just on, on the partons? But you know, this, is, this is an approximation. It is not really true. The full problem is quantum mechanical interference between all possible things that can go on. It's this whole amplitude for proton, proton going to you know, hundreds of pions and cans. That's the, that, that is the problem. Only for certain choices of observable does it break up into the more familiar story that some of you already know involving parton distribution functions, fragmentation functions, and things like that. But that's not true for every observable. Only special observables have that property. Other questions? Okay, so the first example of, of factorization uh, that we're going to see, and I'm not going to prove this at all, and I'm actually going to spend, in some sense, embarrassingly little time on this, given that this is a, a lecture on QCD and collider physics. So I apologize that I'm giving this topic, uh, uh, I'm shortchanging this topic, but just given time limitations, I have to shortchange something, so I'm shortchanging this. Um, are parton distribution functions. And this is a statement that for, again, sufficiently inclusive observables, if I'm trying to calculate the rate for proton-proton going to x, I can replace it with a sum over partons uh, with flavor i and j of a i a j, or a i b j, um, uh, going to x where in this case, uh, i and j are partons. Uh, these are weak quarks, uh, anti-quarks, and gluons. And um, this statement, this replacement, is not true in general. So in general, you're not allowed to do this. Um, it only holds, and indeed only holds conjecturally <laughs> in many cases, for observables that are insensitive to exactly how uh, the proton explodes when you slam the protons together. So if you're insensitive to the beam remnants, then something like this will hold. But if your measurement is sensitive to the detailed properties of the beam remnants, then this is not going to hold. But assuming that that's the case, um, what we have is we have an effective center of mass collision uh, energy for this subprocess and a way of mapping this uh, uh, process of plucking uh, quarks, antiquarks, and gluons out of the proton as separate factorized parton distribution functions. 
so um, instead of having a fixed center of mass collision energy of, let's say, 14 TeV at the LHC, what instead we have is an effective center of mass collision energy where we take the energy of our, of our beams. So these are now four vectors for the, uh, for the beams. So these are the things uh, that uh, we're colliding, let's say protons. And we only take a small fraction of the momentum uh, and give them to these partons. So we're going to take the momentum fraction xA from the proton. So this is proton 1 here, or proton A. Out of proton A, we pluck a particular momentum fraction out. We do the same thing for proton B. And we end up with an effective center of mass collision energy for uh, this, uh, this piece. And um, again, for observables for which that holds, you can now talk about a semi-classical uh, probability function that describes just how much momentum is plucked out of the, part the protons and given to the partons of interest. So in particular, we now have, I guess, quasi-probability distributions. Uh, that tell me, this is a function that tells me for parton of flavor i, let's say for a quark or up quark, what's the probability that when I make that up quark that it's carrying xA fraction of the initial proton's momentum. And I have the same thing for the other side. What's the probability that, let's say, you know, a down quark plucked out of the proton carries x fraction of the momentum? And something that I'm going to, again, and apologies, got to gloss over completely, is that depending on the scale at which you probe the proton, these numbers uh, will change. And so there's a factorization scale, mu, which is basically the scale at which I'm doing this mapping from the, partonic, from the, from the hadronic picture to the partonic picture. And um, these objects, these are, again, parton distribution functions. They're non-perturbative. So I don't know a way of doing a calculation um, uh, in, uh, uh, in perturbative quantum field theory to, to figure out this value. I, I could do a non-perturbative technique like lattice gauge theory to try to extract this information. Um, it's scale dependent, meaning it depends on the scale at which I'm resolving uh, the proton. Uh, and because of the scale dependence, uh, it has uh, a renormalization group evolution. And this is the thing that I'm going to be skipping in these lectures, uh, known as DGLAP evolution. And that scale evolution, though, itself is perturbative. So I have non-perturbative objects defined at some scale. I can, then I can use perturbation theory to evolve it to, to different scales. And there's a whole industry about parton distribution functions, which I'm sweeping under the rug uh, for, for, for these lectures. And, uh, and I, I apologize for that. Um, but then I can, assuming that this works, then I can write down a new master formula. And so our new master formula we replace what we had before now with a, a, a larger number of sub-processes that I combine together. So instead of saying I'm, I'm slamming protons against each other, now I'm just slamming all possible combinations of quarks, antiquarks, and gluons existing inside the proton. And so my new master formula says that the cross-section of observable, I have to sum over all possible incoming states. Uh, let me leave some space here. Um, and instead of colliding uh, at the center of mass collision energy, I'm, I'm colliding uh, at the, uh, the center of mass uh, corresponding 
to uh, squaring that total momentum here, that hatted one. So I have an effective collision energy. We're doing, again, our uh, sum over all possible uh, final states. But now my Lorentz invariant phase space is uh, dependent on a different collision energy. I have an amplitude now for the process of i and j. It goes from 1 to n. And then I have my observable measured on n body phase space. So this part is the same. But instead of thinking about a single scattering process, I now need to have a bunch of them. And in particular, depending on exactly what momentum fractions I pluck out of the proton, I'm going to have different effective collision energies. So I have a factor of, uh, of integrating over all possible collision energies. And then I have an object um, which is uh, usually called in the literature a parton luminosity. Or parton luminosity function. Which basically says, OK, I choose what things are colliding, how much of the total uh, collision rate uh, is going into that particular channel. And this parton luminosity function uh, itself uh, is a function of these parton distribution functions. So I ask, how much momentum am I plucking out of each of the protons with what probability? And then I convert these xA and xB uh, to the effective center mass collision energy. The effective center mass collision energy, at least for massless uh, partons, is just the multiplication of xA, xB, and the original uh, center of mass collision energy, where this S is the original center mass collision energy squared. So proton, proton colliders is really a set of quark and gluon colliders operating at different center of mass collision energies. These are the various center of mass collision energies that I can have. And depending on what this parton luminosity function is, I'm probing different uh, uh, amplitudes here. Yeah? Mm. Right. So. So when, when you're doing formal statements about factorization, the formal statements about factorization, uh, you factorize all at the same scale, and there's a, there's, a, there's a common scale that you're trying to use for different, for different objects. And then if you want to evaluate those objects at different scales, then you do RG running in order to run them to the appropriate scale. Um, but in this factorization picture, you're really supposed to factorize at exactly the same scale. And then if, if there's hierarchies of scale, you do running between those scales. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that aspect of it. Um, but the point that you're bringing up is a, is a good one, which is depending on the process of interest, the appropriate scale for that problem might be different. And one of the powers of factorization is that factorization allows you to evaluate objects at their natural scale. But that's, again, something I'm not really going to be covering here. But if I have a process which has some heavy quarks, yeah. like yeah. mesons, yeah. That's right. And so what you hope is that you hope that the observables you choose have additional factorization properties so that you can separate out those scales. But for the most general question you could ask, that's just not true. The most general question that you would ask have all these scales all combined in some way that you don't have control over. But for the right choice of measurements, you'll actually be able to look at subprocesses, evaluate those subprocesses at their appropriate scale, and then RG evolve between those to capture large logarithms that might appear. So we're not really going to do that in these lectures, but Yes, this is the type of thing that you should be thinking of if you're thinking about wanting to make sure that you have calculability. Okay, let me say just a, a few more words uh, about, about parton distribution functions um, before uh, going on to the next example of factorization, which I'll do in much more detail, uh, partly because I can, <laughs> partly, partly because it's an easy calculation to do and it's a calculation you can do for yourself. Um, Let me just say a little bit more about PDFs. Um, so uh, 
so depending on what the effective uh, collision energy that I'm working at is, uh, that is this, um, th th this factorization scale, the, the PDFs have different properties. So let me um, just sketch for you uh, uh, at the LHC what the, um, well, <laughs> really sketch because this is me translating a plot onto a piece of paper than me trying to plot it here and then realizing that in my rush to make this, I forgot to put any tick marks on this axis. So, so I, I actually don't know what the, what the numbers are here since they don't appear in my notes. And this is some kind of log scale, um, but, but I don't know the details. What I do know is that I, I, I looked at collision energies from 500 GeV up to 2 TeV and basically plotting how much parts on luminosity do I have in various different channels. Um, so uh, the dominant parton luminosity for proton-proton collisions, protons are, um, are, are bags of, uh, of, of quarks and gluons. Um, and one of the dominant contributions, um, it falls with root s, but one of the dominant contributions, this is supposed to be a dashed line, um, is, uh, is I pluck an up quark out of one proton and then pluck a gluon out of the other one. And that turns out to be, uh, at low energies, more dominant than plucking two uh, up quarks. Though eventually, at a little bit higher than a T TeV scale, um, the, uh, the up quark, uh, up up quark uh, uh, dominates. So when I'm doing collisions at the LHC and I'm trying to think about what are the types of things that, that happen, of course, protons contain up quarks and down quarks. We know that. But actually, when you resolve the proton and explode it, um, there is a large contribution coming from having um, uh, gluons. And at low enough energies, gluons really are a big deal. Um, but as you go to higher and higher energies, it's harder to find high energy gluons inside the proton. And so if I look at the glue glue luminosity, um, it ends up uh, kind of being dominant at low scales. So that gives me my glue glue component. Um, but then at high uh, component, high, high scales, I guess this crossover is roughly at a TeV, uh, you end up being dominant more by the, by the up quarks inside the proton. And um, through DGLAP evolution, um, when you find a gluon inside of the proton, uh, that gluon can split to uh, quarks and antiquarks. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, it turns out that if I look at up and anti-up, there's no valence anti-up in the proton, but I can get an anti-up coming from this DGLAP evolution, and that turns out to be a fairly sizable uh, uh, a component to the, to the parton luminosities. And so I haven't done the, the, the curves here for, for, for down quarks as well, or strange quarks or whatnot, but this just gives you a sense that it's a scale-dependent problem. At high scales, um, the valence quarks uh, dominate. So if I'm doing, if I want like the really uh, uh, highest energy processes, that's where up and down uh, matter. At low energies, um, uh, gluons dominate. And because gluons can split to uh, quark-antiquark pairs to DGLAP evolution, you end up getting a, a number of antiquarks that's proportional to the amount of gluons that you have in your system. So the proton is a complicated dynamical object, and I could spend a whole lecture talking about it, but I'm not going to. And so I'm just asserting that for, for uh, sufficiently inclusive measurements, this factorization into PDFs times uh, 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 partonic amplitudes uh, squared is, is appropriate. Okay, let me pause here for, for a second to see if there's any further questions before we go through a more explicit example of, uh, of a factorization. Yes? Uh, why is it that the valence quarks dominate? Good. So, as, as opposed to, as opposed to uh, uh, gluons dominating at high scales? Or, yeah, so, you know, what defines a proton? <laughs> Okay. A proton is the lowest lying configuration that has a certain amount of upness and downness in it. You know, it's, a, it's a charge one state. Um, it has spin a half. And so those defining features are captured by the valence quarks. And if I probe the, the proton at sufficiently high energies, then 
in some sense, the protonness has to be carried by those valence objects. When I look at the proton at lower scales, then the stuff inside the proton can be more diverse and still all sum up to the, uh, the kind of the total amount of upness, downness, the spin structure of it. And that's why it's possible for you to have uh, more gluons there. I guess a more formal statement is that you can just look at the RG uh, evolution of the, of the PDFs. Um, and you can see when you run the PDFs uh, up to high scales, you end up getting dominated by, uh, sorry, not when, sorry. I, what I said was wrong. The, 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 the RG evolution is in the mu, which is the, the, which is the, um, uh, the scale of the process. These uh, uh, X, which is the momentum fraction, has nothing to do with RG scale, sorry. Uh, uh, those scales are, are determined in some sense by the non-perturbative dynamics. And so when you go to low energy machines and measure, when I, when I uh, strike a, a proton, what are the things that dominate uh, at large X, large momentum fraction, that's where you can see, at least just experimentally, uh, that these valence contributions dominate. Should I give you some sense? Okay. Um, there's also ways of convincing yourself uh, that this should be true using momentum sum rules, um, and uh, that you expect if, I, if I'm extracting a large fraction of momentum out of the proton for a single parton, that it's more likely to be of the valence type. Other questions? Okay, so um, the example that I want to spend uh, kind of the rest of this lecture talking about is an example um, where if you've seen this before, hopefully this is a good review, and if you've never seen this before, hopefully you are at least initially baffled, and then it will be a revelation. Um, so... Um, what we're going to try to think about is we're going to try to think about the proton-proton to top-anti-top cross-section. And of course, as I mentioned, you can't directly measure this. You have to choose your measurement function. Okay, but let me just push some of that aside for a second. And if I use these PDFs, uh, then I can replace protons, let's say, with, with gluons. So now I'm talking about the process where I have a glue-glue. Uh, and let's say I have it through T-channel uh, top exchange and I can make glue glue to TT bar. And I want to calculate the cross-section for this process. So, you know, we could you know, go to our field theory textbooks, look up the Feynman rules for this, or maybe use some on-shell methods in order to do this um, using more fa fancy amplitudeology. Um, but there's an immediate confusion looking at this process, which is that the top quark is unstable, and so, you really shouldn't be calculating this process. That's not the process that you should be calculating. Really, the process you should be calculating is this one, where the top decays to BW, and the anti-top, let's say, uh, decays to uh, uh, anti-B and W. And this is what you're supposed to calculate. Oh, wait, but the W is unstable, so you shouldn't be calculating this. Um, you should really be calculating um, this decay, let's say this, this is just an example decay. There's many other decays of the W. Um, and then if, anticipating the next lecture, oh, then these, these, uh, these V jets are uh, up, bar, and down. Like, those will turn into jets, and so I have to talk about jet algorithms and all that. But you can now ask this Feynman diagram versus this Feynman diagram versus this Feynman diagram. They're all at different orders in the coupling. You know, this one involves two couplings uh, where if I square it, I get alpha S squared. Um, here, I have some weak couplings up here. Here, I have some more weak couplings up here. And you can ask the question, which of these diagrams is the correct one for doing the calculation of the TT bar cross-section? Because in perturbation theory, it looks like I get very different answers because there are different orders in the couplings. Does anyone want to, want, want to, want to, uh, to, to, to vote right? or guess which one is the better way to do it? Do, do, I, do I look at, is it glue glue to TT bar? Is it glue glue to BW, B bar W? Is it glue glue 
to uh, B E nu C bar. Which is the better estimate of this process? So maybe we could do it by show of hands. You have three options, A, B, and C. Think for a second what you think is the best way of calculating this. Okay. So how many people think that the most accurate thing that I could do is to calculate this process? So by show of hands. Okay. We have like maybe a third of you. How about think that it's this process? No one thinks it's that bad. <laughs> what about this one? Okay. So the, the, the rest of you. Okay. It turns out that you are all correct. And remarkably, again, for the, for the correct choice of observable, this and this and this give you the same answer for the TT bar cross-section. And you say, how is that possible? Like, how is it, po how is it possible that, uh, I mean, these, these, these Feynman diagrams are very different, very different amounts of complexity. How is it possible that here I have to sum over this plus all the other ways that the W could decay? How is it possible that I get the same answer if at the level of Feynman diagrams they look so different? So, so how many people know what the answer is? How many people know why actually all these things give the same answer? I see. Does anyone know? Does anyone know what the magic words are for, for why this is this? What? Jets. No, jets will tell me why. If I, that, by the way, that was an excellent guess that, that, that in general when dealing with Jesse Thaler, um, <laughs> that, that the jets are a good answer. Yeah. Face space. Face space, I mean, in some ways, yes, but only in a detailed way. Yeah, but why? Like, 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 technically, why? I mean, like, like, look at, like, imagine doing perturbation theory. In perturbation theory, I have something that's has two couplings, four couplings, or six couplings. How can I possibly get the same answer? What? Yeah, uni unitarity is telling me something about how that could happen. But how does that like actually manifest itself in the calculation? I mean, it's going to end up looking like that. We're going to see that this process is dominated by the tops and the Ws being on shell. And in that sense, you're kind of using w, or, or unitary like methods to, to, to process this. But like really mechanically, if I'm going and doing the calculation, or if I, if I hand this to a computer program to do, somehow they better give the same answer. And how does that happen? Do what? Um, no, no, no. So, so when, I'm, when I'm doing scattering, I have to decide what I'm doing. So I can't, I can't do this and this and this. This is not a correction to this. I'm saying that these are almost give all the same answer. Yeah. The decay width of the top goes into the propagator. The decay width of the top goes into the propagator. So that's definitely part of it. Do you know what the do you know what the what the the name of the the technique is that when you account for decay widths in doing these calculations, you know what that's called? The narrow width approximation. And the narrow width approximation for me is a really nice example of factorization where you see under what assumptions you're able to make these things be approximately the same. And so that's what I'm going to be spending the rest of the time going through is the narrow width approximation. Was there another question here? Yeah. So, uh, like, the mass of PT bar, yeah. which was like uh, 200 times of mass of a proton. Yeah. So, uh, like, we need to consider very many protons. Yeah. Yes. And uh, like, but their cross section is going to be very small because of this thing. Yes. Right? But the order is only second. On the further end, we have higher cross sections, but. Uh... No, so, so the, these, these, these processes actually will be at exactly the same scale. So if I want to think about them in terms of factorization scales, the appropriate scale for evaluating all these will be the same scale. So, so it's not an interplay between PDFs and these processes, it has to do with this appearance of the width. Um, when I'm in the, in the propagator. Or s said another way, um, uh, uh, you know, some of you might have used uh, tools like, uh, like, like MadGraph uh, to do uh, calculations. And <laughs> if, you, if you've ever run MadGraph and you haven't thought carefully about what you're doing, let's say you, you implement some new physics model and you forget to put the widths in there, or you just put random numbers for the widths, you'll find that your answer depends very sensitively on those random numbers for the widths. And you would say, wait, why do I care what the widths are? Um, the widths correspond to, um, to, to, in some sense, 
parts of this diagram that I don't see. So if I actually calculate this thing at tree level, um, I, I don't actually see any width structure from this. Um, but you have to be thinking about the kind of the all orders process uh, in order to realize that, oh no, when I'm doing this, if I don't include the width in the propagator, then I just get complete garbage. In fact, I just get infinity. Um, and, and we'll see uh, how that happens explicitly. Okay. But again, I, I'm using this as an example of, of, of factorization um, where remarkably this whole process will split up into pieces that to a very good approximation, I can talk about this whole process as a hard scattering, glue glue goes to TT bar, a decay of top goes to BW, a decay of the W, and these pieces I can treat in kind of a semi-classical way, as if I had made a real top, as if I had made a real W, and then I watch them decay. But why, the reason why I'm going to go through the narrow width approximation is that it's an approximation, and you have to think about what information am I throwing out when I'm doing that approximation. And then what we'll see for jets is that jets are the approximation only uh, when applied to uh, massless partons. Okay, so that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna go for, for the next lecture. Um, so. Other questions before I continue here? So once you see, see this, you won't be able to unsee it. And, uh, and, and you, you, you can, you know, if you, you have you know, uh, colleagues or friends you know, in your home institutions, and you can, you can ask them the same question, they'll be baffled. And then you can tell them the answer, and then they'll be illuminated too. Um, so. And you know, I was around your age when I learned this. Um, and a whole amount of collider physics made way more sense to me once I, once I saw this. And so, so eventually, we're going to talk about the narrow width approximation. That's kind of a baby version of factorization. But before we can do that, I need to tell you a little bit more about uh, phase space and, and, and integrals and kinematics. Um, so let's just remind ourselves about some basic uh, kinematic facts. So we're going to be talking about four vectors. Um, and so four vectors have uh, energy and momentum. And uh, if I want to look at the uh, invariant mass of, uh, of, of an object, I'll often just write this as p squared. And uh, this is equal to taking the energy squared and subtracting uh, the momentum squared. And here I'm using the mostly minus uh, 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 metric, which is very standard in collider physics. And if I want to know about where a single particle can go, so if I want to do uh, Lorentz invariant phase space, so Lorentz invariant phase space for just a single particle. Um, I want to integrate over all components of my four vector. And then by convention, there's factors of 2 pi that I have to keep track of. And this thing is manifestly Lorentz invariant. That is, if I do a, a Lorentz transformation, this part doesn't change. And when I have particles in the final state, stable or quasi-stable particles, I have an on-shell condition. And uh, for uh, outgoing particles, we have uh, positive energy. So we have an on-shell and positive energy. And this is a uh, manifestly Lorentz invariant way of talking about where things go. Now, if you've seen Lorentz invariant phase space before, uh, you might have seen this written in a different way. You might have seen uh, that I integrate over just the momentum components. That is, I do this integral over, over the mass. Um, and then I get uh, this factor where uh, this uh, uh, energy here is, uh, is just the square root of mass squared plus momentum squared. And this is not manifestly Lorentz invariant. And so if you try to do the analyses that I'm going to be doing uh, in this lecture this way, you'll get yourself very confused. So let's go to the way where the symmetries are manifest in the problem, and that's going to make our life a lot easier when we're doing the narrow width approximation.
OK, so this is everywhere a single particle can go. But overall, we need to have uh, total uh, energy momentum conservation. And total energy momentum conservation means that I have to impose a constraint that the overall four vector for my particles 1, 2, up to n in the final state have to be equal to whatever the four vector is corresponding to the center of mass collision. And so this is my n particle final state. And I combine one of these Lorentz invariant phase space integrals for each of those n particles. Basically, all the possible ways that those momentum can go impose energy momentum conservation, and that gives me Lorentz invariant uh, in body phase space. So um, let's uh, uh, see this for a particular thing. So I talked about the master formula uh, in terms of cross sections. Um, but we can also talk about, um, in this uh, narrow width context, we can talk about the decay width for a particle of mass m. So if I want to calculate the decay width, let's say I have a, a particle A that's decaying. Um, there's, a, uh, again, kind of like a geometric factor for the decay width. And then um, I uh, have my sum over all things that can happen, uh, my integral over Lorentz invariant phase space, um, and then the amplitude for A to go from 1 to n. And decay width, this has dimension of mass. And so now we can just check to make sure that for this formula with Lorentz invariant phase space that we actually get the dimensions to work out. So uh, let's just double check that to make sure we're OK. So just to be super, super explicit. Um, uh, let me just say, so, so n, the, the actual integral over n-body phase space, uh, what does it have? OK, we have for each particle, i goes from 1 to n, each one of them, we can ask, where does it go? We can enforce that it's on shell, and on shell to a mass corresponding to whatever that state is. Um, and we can enforce that as positive energy. And then we have to enforce that the entire system uh, conserves energy and momentum. Okay, so that's the integral that I'm doing um, when, let's say, I'm calculating the width or calculating a cross section. And something that's convenient to do is just to make sure that we know what the number of degrees of freedom are. So if we want to count degrees of freedom, We start off for all of our particles. We have n particles, which we're talking about four vectors. So we have four n degrees of freedom, so that we have four n off-shell degrees of freedom. We have n constraints, these uh, n delta functions that put me on mass shell. So these are on-shell constraints. And then we have four uh, uh, energy momentum constraints. And so the total dimensionality of n-body phase space is, is 3n minus 4. So if I just make a little table here of the, uh, the, the number of particles that I have and the number of degrees of freedom that I have, um, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. OK, so if I start off with 2, uh, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 4 is 2. And so if I'm doing a process where I have uh, one particle decaying to 2, there's only two degrees of freedom. That is, uh, the on-shell conditions uh, tell me what the moment, overall momentum is of those th things, and all I have are the two degrees of freedom that tell me which decay angle that I have. Here I have five. So you always add three when you add more dimensions of phase space. Uh, here I go to eight. Uh, here I go to 11, and so on. 
And so, you know, your, your, your life is simpler uh, uh, the, in terms of the integrals that you have to do if you're looking at lower body phase space. And once you get to extremely high body phase space, now just the, even if you can calculate those amplitudes, the integration that you have to do over these uh, large numbers of degrees of freedom can become prohibitive. Okay, so let's check our dimension counting. Going back to this formula, make, let's make sure that everything works out in terms of dimensions. Okay, so for our, our width formula here, so just pointing at that formula up there, the overall um, uh, width, our, our hope is that it's going to have plus one mass dimension. Let's hope that works out. Okay, that one over two m factor that has uh, mass dimension minus one. The uh, integral over phase space, even though there are three n minus four uh, 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 phase space degrees of freedom, because of this funny delta function constraint that involves p squared minus uh, m squared, you can convince yourself that uh, this, uh, in terms of mass dimension, is 2n minus 4 instead of 3n minus 4. And the mismatch between 2 and 3 comes from the fact that this delta function has a p squared. Um, so that, that drops the dimension by that. Um, here I have an amplitude um, for uh, uh, n plus 1 objects. So I have a decaying to 1, 2 to n. So I have n plus 1 objects. And if you remember, uh, in quantum field theory, the dimension of an amplitude is 4 minus the number of legs. Um, and then this thing has to be multiplied by 2 because that whole thing is squared. And if I've done this correctly, then this plus this plus this should equal. Um, and I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, so what do we have? 8 uh, minus 2n. Uh, wait, so 4 minus 1 is 3, so it's 6 minus 2n. OK, this is the n's cancel. That's good. 6 minus 4 minus 1 is indeed plus 1. So widths have, have, the, have the appropriate uh, 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 units. So that's, that's, that's good. OK, so let's say someone says, please calculate a width for me. I say, great. Let's do a, a width calculation. Um, and this will be relevant when we talk about, let's say, top decays. And the top decays to a b and a w, so in that case, the degrees of freedom are just two. So let's just do the more abstract case. We have A decaying to B and C. And so what we have is we can imagine a particle A sitting at rest, minding its own business, and then quantum mechanics comes in and says, okay, you have to decay now. So this decays to uh, B and C. By the energy momentum constraints, the energy and the momentum of, of B and C are fixed. I'll tell you what that fixed value is in a second. But we don't know which angle it decays with. Um, so uh, we have an angle between some you know, reference axis. What is the, uh, the polar angle and the azimuthal angle with respect to that, uh, uh, that, that axis? For example, in the case of the top quark, that axis could be, let's say, the spin direction of the top. Um, and we have those two degrees of freedom uh, as claimed here. And then the rest of the uh, properties of these particles are just fixed. So if we work in the rest frame for A, we start off with a four vector where all the energy is just mass energy. Um, then we have a decay where uh, the on-shell condition tells me that uh, the energy for particle B has to be uh, the square root of the mass squared of B plus whatever overall momentum K it has, and we'll solve for K in a second. Uh, the direction that it goes, uh, it has X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, where I guess I'm defining this to be the z direction. Um, so we have to have various trigonometric factors. Um, and then uh, particle C here, its on shell condition is slightly different. But by energy momentum conservation, this whole thing here uh, has to be the same uh, as here with an overall minus sign, so just that these sum up to give me momentum conservation. And an exercise uh, which you can do for yourself um, is to uh, convince yourself that energy conservation, of course, implies that whatever total energy I started off with has to be distributed uh, among those two particles, and energy has to be conserved. And 
with a little bit of algebra. You can solve for this k. And this seems like a perfect thing for those of you who need to take an exam for this class to go through this exercise and correct any typos that I might have in these notes. Okay. And then we have to look at what two-body Lorentz invariant phase space looks like. And you can do um, a, a really st relatively straightforward um, uh, calculation to convince yourself that once you've done all the Jacobians and everything, uh, that uh, two-body Lorentz invariant phase space looks like an integral over the solid angle uh, of uh, uh, component of theta and, uh, and phi with some 1 over 32 pi squared factor. Um, and then there's just a constant 2k over ma. This 2 over ma in this k, that's this overall prefactor here, such that if the masses of, uh, of, of b and c were 0, this thing would just be 1. Um, and uh, this number is, is less than 1. And this tells you that when you have uh, a decaying to b and c, if b and c have mass, then there's just a, a, a reduction in the phase space for decay. Uh, from the fact that those particles have mass. Um, and uh, note that if k goes to 0, then there's no phase space to have the decay happen. And as expected, the, uh, the integration over phase space uh, uh, dies away. OK, so let's do our, our, our first <laughs> calculation of how I go from diagrams to cross sections, or in this case, going from a diagram to a, uh, to a partial width. So um, let's look at a typical amplitude. So my amplitude here is going to be, I don't know, let's say I do W decay. So I have W decaying to, to Q Q bar here. And what does thing, this thing look like? Well, it has a coupling of some type. And uh, this amplitude uh, for, uh, for, for two-body uh, uh, phase space, uh, this amplitude better have mass dimension 1, uh, because this is uh, a three-point amplitude, so that has mass dimension 1. And I don't know, let's just take the biggest mass scale in the problem, uh, MA. There you go. And that's my, my field theory calculation. Of course, you can be more careful and actually take into account like some of the spins. But, but kind of this is like a typical scale that you might get for this. And if someone gave you this function, which again might depend on angles if you were doing polarized decays, but in this case, let's imagine unpolarized, then what we would find um, is that we would find, assuming that MB and MC are, are sufficiently small, then we'd find that the, the decay width uh, has a factor of g squared from the amplitude. It has a factor of uh, 64 pi squared um, uh, coming from uh, these factors here. Um, we have uh, uh, a factor of ma uh, coming from the amplitude, but then there's a 1 over ma in the formula for the width, which I unfortunately just erased. And then there's an integral over phase space. That integral of phase space just gives me 4 pi, because that's the, the, um, the area element on the sphere. And so you get something that looks like g squared ma over 16 pi squared. So that's like a typical width of, uh, of, of, of a particle. Um, and again, we could be more fancy <laughs> and do the real calculation, but that, that's sufficient for our purposes right now. And what we're going to see in a moment when we do the narrow width approximation is that given this width, we can calculate the branching ratio. So this is a, this is a partial width for this given process. Um, we can calculate the branching ratio of A going to a given final state by just the ratio of the partial width of A going to a particular configuration X over uh, the, uh, the total uh, width, where uh, the total width is just given by the sum over all of the various partial widths. 
And this formula is going to pop out of the analysis that we're going to do for the narrow width approximation. OK, so I cleverly chose to do two-body phase space because that's easy to do. We could do the same thing for three-body phase space and whatnot. Um, hopefully, th this is a review for at least half of the people uh, in the audience. Um, let me just pause here to see if you have any questions about what we're doing here. OK. So the magic uh, for the narrow width approximation comes from the following fact, which you could prove for yourself. Of course, I just erased the thing that I wanted to keep. So the following uh, fact about n-body phase space will be useful. So this is a decomposition of n-body phase space. And let me, let me put, it, put an exact decomposition of n-body phase space. So there's absolutely no approximations being made here. Even though it's going to look like I'm making an assumption, I'm not making an assumption. Exact decomposition of n-body phase space behaves like the following. So if I look at n-body phase space for starting off um, in some uh, uh, center of mass frame and going to particles 1, 2, up to n, then there's a way of writing this phase space. So again, we have center of mass. If I want to draw it as kind of like pseudo Feynman di diagrams, where these, uh, the connecting lines imply uh, momentum conservation. Of course, this looks like a decay process. So I'm, I'm trying to make your brain think that this is some kind of decay process. But this is just a statement about Lorentz invariant uh, n-body phase space. That this is equal to n minus 1 body phase space, where from the center of mass frame, I go to some intermediate system x, and then 3 up to n. I integrate over all possible invariant masses that that x subsystem could have. And then I look at two-body phase space for the x subsystem uh, decaying to 1, 2. So at the end of the day, the final process uh, looks roughly the same. Um, but instead of going in the full n-body phase space, the center of mass frame to all n particles, I go from the center of mass frame to a state x, then all the rest of the particles. And then x looks like it goes to 1 and 2. So again, this is an exact decomposition. I haven't done anything. And the reason why I haven't done anything is because I integrate over all masses. So I'm not assuming that there is a particle x here that exists. All I'm saying is that at the level of phase space, if I integrate over all n-body phase space, it's the same as if I integrated over n minus 1 body phase space, integrated over 2 body phase space, and integrated over all possible masses for this intermediate state. Of course, I just said the word intermediate state. It's not an intermediate state. It's just the, kinem <laughs> the kinematics that I, would, uh, that I would get as if it were kind of like an intermediate state. And this is something that you can uh, prove for yourself. And if you want to have uh, fun um, uh, doing this exercise, I'm not going to take that fun away from you, so I'm not going to prove it for you now. But I'm going to tell you the trick. And so the trick, uh, if you want to do this for yourself, is that you take n-body phase space, and you just cleverly insert the quantity 1 into it and uh, rearrange. So the, 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 a fancy way of writing 1 is to do an integral over this fictitious particle x. But I do this integral in such a way that there's a delta function constraint that says that I'm integrating over all possible ways that x can go, but then I have a delta function constraint such that when I do this integral, I just get 1. And then you have to do another uh, uh, thing where you have to integrate over all possible masses for x. Uh, 
But, oh, I'm going to put a delta function constraint in here. You also want to have positive energy. And this is another fancy way of writing one. So you take these fancy ways of writing one, you insert it into here, and instead of doing this integral first and this integral so I get one, you do some of the other integrals in the problem and you'll get this formula here. And so this is a perfect thing for you to stop by my office and, and uh, try to do it for yourself and I can, I can help you. Uh, and this will be the key uh, uh, to seeing how the narrow width approximation works in terms of, 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 of the mechanical, uh, how, it, how it works. Again, I haven't made any approximations yet. This is just a convenient <laughs> rewriting phase space, but a one that's very suggestive. It suggests that if, instead of integrating over all masses, if there can be a dominant part of the process that puts this thing on shell, then I'll really factorize uh, into a process for producing a, a nearly on shell x and that nearly on shell x decaying. But again, at this level, I haven't done the approximations. The approximations will come in a moment. OK, let me pause for a moment before we do the actual approximation. So we're going to talk about the narrow width approximation. And this is really the workhorse of collider phenomenology. And it's so important we, we often forget um, that is an approximation. That is, we often talk about particles like the Higgs boson, and we say, there's a Higgs boson. It has a mass, it has a width, it has these decay rates. But strictly speaking, what we're really doing is just measuring cross sections, and we never actually get a chance to hold the Higgs boson in our hand and, and inquire about its properties. And there are corrections to the properties that we ascribe to the Higgs boson coming from, for example, quantum mechanical interference effects. So when you make a Higgs boson to a given final state, it can interfere with the standard model process that might have nothing to do with the Higgs boson. And when we're making a cross-section measurement, we have to deal with that interference. The narrow width approximation is, in some sense, asserting the reality of a state. But it's just an approximation. And we have to keep that in mind that there's always potential for quantum mechanical interference when you have uh, unstable states. So we're going to do this in the case of, of the top quark decay. Um, uh, just because this is, uh, well, a ubiquitous uh, particle produced at, at the LHC, but also the kind of the simplest version of showing you the narrow width approximation in action. And so I'm not going to do TT bar cross section, but the TT bar cross section effectively just requires two copies of what I'm doing right now, uh, plus an additional uh, a piece having to do with the hard scattering process. But let's just do the, 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 the top quark decay. And the statement that we're going to find is that if I look at the top to B, W, and let's say W goes to uh, positron and neutrino, and if I take this squared amplitude, then this is, to a very good approximation, the same as, at the, as uh, the amplitude for T goes to B, uh, sorry, amplitude plus integration over phase space. After doing the integral over phase space, this is going to be the same as t goes to bw times w goes to positron uh, neutrino. And then here's a key fact that was brought up earlier, is that we have to account for the width and so we'll see a sum over all possible final states here of what the W can do. 
this case the w, let's say, uh, going to some state x. So let's look at this for a second. So we say, here's a case where I have two couplings. And when I do the squared amplitude, I get four coupling constants. And I'm telling you that this thing, after you do the integral over phase space, is basically this thing. But this thing only has one coupling here in the amplitude. And then squared, I get two. Two versus four, they don't match up. What happened to the other couplings? Well, one coupling is here. But another one, unbeknownst to you, has shown up in the denominator. And these things cancel against each other, which is why this and this, when I do the appropriate integral over phase space, are the same. Okay. And this is, a, this is a, a, um, an example of, of factorization in the sense that I have a complicated process, but I can factorize this complicated 1 to 3 process into a product of 1 to 2, 1 to 2 processes up to corrections. And again, jet physics will look kind of similar to that when we get to that uh, tomorrow. So what's the key to the, to the narrow approximation? The key to the narrow width approximation is that there must be some kind of singular structure uh, uh, in this. There must be some kind of singularity that surprises me, that somehow I have this tree-level diagram, and I'm surprised, and oh, somehow I get something appearing in the denominator. So where is there a singularity in this problem? Where's the singularity in this, in this problem here? What is the chance of, of violating the naive order of perturbation theory? This is fourth order, looks like this is this amplitude is second order perturbation theory. This looks like first order perturbation theory. Somehow, I, these are supposed to be the same. So this must be some kind of violation of naive perturbation theory. There must be some kind of singularity or infinity that's showing up. Where is it showing up in this diagram? So it's that I have a chance of, of getting this. Yeah? Uh, w going on shell. W going on shell. OK. Because W is going on shell, I get a large number. So let's look at this W propagator. So the key to the narrow width approximation is this W propagator. There's a, some kind of momentum Q flowing through this propagator. There's a mass associated with it. I'm going to eventually have to mod square it. And if I resum diagrams that uh, contribute to, um, I guess, the, the self-energy diagrams for, uh, for the, the W boson, um, I have to. Uh, include width effects, and there's an imaginary part that appears, and this imaginary part is, is related to the fact that the, the W boson is unstable. Um, and this thing, when Q gets close to M, this thing blows up in your face. In fact, if, if there were no width, I would just get infinity. But because I have a width, um, this object looks kind of like a restriction that q squared always has to be m squared. So it looks like a delta function constraint um, that, uh, that, that q squared has to be m squared. But it's regulated by the width. So I have a pi over m gamma. And if I took the width to 0, then this thing would just completely blow up in my face. And so it's the fact that I have the singularity here, but regulated by the width, that puts things, roughly speaking, on shell, again, this is a plus corrections. And the amount by which it goes on shell uh, uh, depends on this width. And this 1 over gamma here, that ends up being this 1 over this structure that, uh, that appears here. Okay. So if you ignore finite width effects, including possible quantum mechanical interference between various diagrams, then this is a good approximation if, if, uh, if gamma is small enough. Of course, you have to be aware of cases where this doesn't work. And once we have the, these ingredients, then the derivation of, of narrow width in this case is, is quite straightforward. And you'll see where some of the bodies are, are buried. Now, you can kind of anticipate where this is going for jets. For jets, we have quarks and gluons, which are approximately massless. But we're still going to have those propagators. And when propagators for quarks and gluons go on shell, we're going to get the same kind of splitting of the phase space. And that's going to be key for our understanding of jets. So that's why I'm going through the narrow width approximation in some detail here, so that I can go a lot faster when we, uh, when we talk about jets and just assert facts to you. And you'll believe it, because you've seen one example where it basically works and where you can do it yourself uh, in, your, in your office. 
then hopefully you'll just believe me <laughs> when I tell you what some of the factorization properties are when I go to the, to the uh, massless QCD case. Okay, so um, what do we have? So there are two key ingredients plus an approximation. Let's see if I can fit the ingredients here and the approximation here. Let me see if I can fit the final answer on this board. Okay, so one ingredient is three-body phase space. So this is the three-body phase space for top goes to B positron neutrino. And this, we argued, um, just without any approximation, uh, can be described in terms of the two-body phase space for T goes to BW without imposing uh, uh, a mass condition on the W, and then the two-body phase space for W goes to uh, positron and a neutrino. Again, no approximations here. This is just a decomposition of n-body phase space. In terms of amplitudes, again, no approximations yet. The amplitude for a top going to the uh, positron neutrino, well, what is this? We said there's a propagator in it, where the mass now is the mass of the W, and the, uh, the width, uh, uh, and the mass here are the mass of the W. And then we have, just at the level of Feynman diagrams, we have something that looks like uh, the amplitude for a top going to BW, and it looks like an amplitude for W going to uh, uh, electron uh, neutrino. But those amplitudes, those subprocesses, depend on the polarization of the W. So epsilon will correspond to polarization. I have to sum over the polarizations, the three polarizations of the W. And I haven't done any approximations yet. So if this is unfamiliar to you, you can come to my office. Um, but how you do this, but basically this is just a rewriting, stripping off the propagator part, and then dealing with the, the subamplitudes of these processes. Where again, the mass of the W has not been forced uh, on shell yet. Uh, this is all uh, off-shell structures. Now we have an approximation. And the approximation that we're going to make is that this sum over polarizations, which is inside this squared amplitude, I'm just going to pull it out. So you could ask to what extent this is a good idea or not. But it means that I'm losing potential quantum mechanical interference effects. So I'm, so I'm suppressing potential information. And depending on the process of interest, this might be a big or a small or not at all. It doesn't make any difference. But that's, that's one thing we're doing. Then I have these subprocesses here. Um, and these squares are, are innocuous. And then I'm going to take, so that's one approximation pulling the sum of polarizations out. But another approximation is replacing uh, this with that uh, estimate up there, where this is now an now this looks like, an, at least approximately, an on-shell uh, 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 constraint on the W. And now if I reassemble these pieces, what do I have? So I started off with trying to figure out what is the, um, the partial width of a top going to a B, a positron, and a neutrino. And so the real calculation that I'm supposed to do involves an integral over three-body phase space of this whole amplitude. And what I'm saying is that I can break this up. I can factorize it into pieces, at least approximately. And so what do I have? Well, I have a sum over polarizations. That's this part here. I have an integral over two-body phase space. That's this part here. I have the uh, uh, amplitude for the subprocess. Top goes to, to BW. 
I have an integral over the phase space of the W. That's this part. I have a pi over uh, gamma m. And isn't it nice and convenient that I had a pi here, and I have a 1 over pi here. And when these pi's cancel, I'm going to end up getting the 1 over 2m, which is necessary for defining a width. And then I have, finally, the integral over two-body phase space, again, with the sum over amplitude, uh, sum over, over positions, rather, of the decay of the W boson. Okay. Now all I need to do is interpret uh, these, uh, these various pieces. And I forgot something. I forgot um, in here <laughs> the, the absolute key part. <laughs> <laughs> which is that I need to put uh, this, uh, this on-shell condition here. OK, so stare at that expression for a little bit. Let me know if you have any questions about it. And then we can see to what extent this formula here is, is correct. OK, so what do I have? So this is what I was trying to calculate. More formally, up there, what am I trying to get? I'm trying to get the partial width of T goes to B uh, positron neutrino. What is it equal to? Well, that first line, oops. this first line up here looks like just the width of um, T goes to BW. So this is um, uh, just the width here of T goes to BW. I have this on-shell condition that kills this, uh, this, uh, this integral over, over possible MWs. The pi's cancel. The 2's arrange themselves in the right way, such that with this 1 over 2M and this thing, we get the. Uh, the partial width of W goes to electron neutrino. And then we have to be careful. This width down here, this is the width that appears in the propagator. That's the total width. That's all possible decay channels. So this is the total width of the W. And this factor here is better known as the branching ratio of W going to positron neutrino. So the full three-body optic A factorizes into, uh, uh, into a, into a two-body decay times another two-body decay, or two-body decay times a, times, a, times a branching ratio. So this is why, for the, for the case of thinking about top production, it didn't matter where I did my calculation, at least with a narrow width approximation. Um, uh, you end up getting these branching ratio factors. Um, and so for the case of, for example, uh, uh, let's say glue-glue uh, goes to B, B-bar, uh, electron neutrino up, down bar, this is very well approximated by that cross-section for glue-glue uh, going to TT-bar times the branching fraction for one of the tops uh, to K to B electron neutrino, and the other top, or the top bar, to K to B bar, uh, U bar D. And again, this is so ingrained in the way that we talk about particle physics that we would often just write this down directly. But again, it's only an approximation. In, in, in real life, there's interference things. We're suppressing uh, those uh, in this analysis. Any questions about this? Yes? Uh, why did we take that uh, approximation? Can we not calculate it uh, that the summation inside the square? Good. So you're asking, why did I pull this out front? So you're right. We shouldn't pull it out front. We should leave it in there. But oftentimes, we like to talk about 
the decay rate for a top to give me a longitudinal versus transversely polarized W. So that's a, that's a quantity that we, we often talk about. Strictly speaking, we shouldn't have pulled that out. So we really shouldn't be talking about the, the decay width to a particular polarization of a state. But it makes sense in, in the narrow width approximation. Um, but you're also correct that you do not need to do that pulling out. So there are ways of using the narrow width approximation where you only make the on-shell constraint, but you actually keep the full um, spin structure intact. And so there are, there are strategies for, for doing things like that, where you, where you keep all those possible interference terms. Um, and so if I, if I remember right, uh, some aspect of the Herwig Monte Carlo generator does something like that. Um, that answer your, your question? Um, you could also ask the question, wait, why did you do this? Why didn't you add plus higher order terms? Like, why not do a systematic expansion? And indeed, there are people who talk about effective field theories for particles that are nearly on shell, but not quite. And then you can actually do a systematic expansion to improve on, on, on this. There's another question. I say the same question, yeah. But th that's exactly the right question to ask. Why are you doing more um, uh, constraints than are absolutely needed, or more approximations that are absolutely needed? And we'll do a better job if we reduce uh, the number of constraints that we apply. And really, the thing that we want to do is not do approximations, but do systematic expansions. And this is the first step of the more systematic expansion for what you do when you have um, uh, 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 narrow particles. OK, so let me just wrap up um, just to summarize uh, 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 what we've talked about. Um, and to, to set the stage for, for the next lecture. So the master formula says that you're supposed to calculate PP going to quasi-stable particles. With PDFs, you can replace that. You can replace the PP. You can replace that with a sum over IJ uh, of IJ, where these are now uh, partonic states. With the uh, narrow width approximation, uh, we can also often break up cross sections, uh, cross sections for some process. We can break it up into cross sections for a subprocess times some uh, product of, of of branching ratios. But we have to think very carefully, <laughs> are these appropriate? And that depends on the choice of observable. So for certain choices of observable, I can do, I can do choices of observable for which that I can make the narrow width approximation fail dramatically. So one way of making the narrow width approximation fail dramatically is let's say I'm doing E plus E minus collisions but I'm doing E plus E minus collisions below the top quark mass. In that case, I'm never actually making the top quark on shell, and so trying to force it to be on shell using the narrow width approximation doesn't make sense. Um, and there's other types of phase space restrictions uh, uh, that I can uh, impose that would break this. So we have to think about our observables very carefully. Um, and uh, in the next lecture, we're going to extend this logic uh, to QCD radiation, that when I have quarks or gluons that get close to on shell, we'll see that amplitudes factorize in a nice way, and I'll take an extreme limit of that factorization to show you an example of a calculation in jet substructure. Um, and then finally, for people who are interested uh, in, my, in, in my notes, I have uh, the, the, the decay tables for all the branching ratios for the W, the Z, the Higgs in the top, and the main uh, role of this is to just convince you that jets appear 70% of the time, which is a motivation for why in the next lecture we're gonna be focusing on jets. Okay, let me stop there, thank you.